For over 40 years, complex computer models have been used to try to predict how much global warming will result from adding carbon dioxide to Earth's atmosphere. Literally billions of dollars have been spent on these efforts. One would expect that the models should get more and more accurate as they're revised over time. Instead, comparing their projections with real world, world observations shows that they're getting less accurate. Tonight on From the Stacks, NASA award-winning climate scientist, Dr. Roy W. Spencer joins us to discuss this and other tough questions facing climate scientists around the world and the policymakers whose decisions depend in part on their findings. Invite your friends to join you and stay tuned. The temperature of Earth's atmosphere near the surface has risen by about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less, in about the last 150 years. Some of that increase, perhaps more than half, likely is a result of carbon dioxide added to the atmosphere, largely from burning coal, oil, and natural gas to provide transportation and heating fuel and electricity, all of which have been indispensable to lifting humanity out of what today we would call extreme poverty, but what our ancestors called just ordinary life. Now, some people fear that if we continue adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, we'll cause so much warming that catastrophe will follow. Rapidly rising sea level, more frequent and severe hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, droughts, and wildfires, and the spread of diseases once limited to the tropics. They demand that we cut back our use of fossil fuels to prevent this catastrophe and replace them with wind, solar, and other non-carbon-based alternatives, even if that means slowing, stopping, or even reversing the economic growth that has conquered poverty. And I'm Cal Beisner, founder and national spokesman of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Tonight on From the Stacks, NASA award-winning scientist, uh, Dr. Roy W. Spencer will help you understand some of the basic climate, uh, basics of climate scientists, no science, pardon me, the role uh, that computer climate models play in undergirding those fears of catastrophic warming and why the fears are unfounded because the models don't accurately portray reality. Welcome to From the Stacks. I'm Megan Kennard, Director of Operations and Communications for the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Thanks for joining us. We hope you'll enjoy the program and find it educational. Keep in mind that you can use the comments section under Facebook to post questions, and as much as we can, we'll address those questions live as we go along or at the end of the show. Also, we wanna let you know that throughout the month of November, while supplies last, we'll send a free copy of the DVD documentary, Fractured, Language, Lies, and Energy, as our gift to you when you give a 100% tax-deductible donation of literally any size and request it. To receive your copy, just go to www.cornwallalliance.org, click on the Donate button, fill out the donation, and in the comments field on the second page, write Fractured, or just mention promo code 20-11. <sighs> Thanks, Megan. Friends, Fractured isn't the only thing we'll offer you tonight. Dr. Spencer has written some outstanding short books that can really help you to understand climate science and all the controversies about global warming. They're great things to give to friends who are caught up in the fears, so we'll also offer you the opportunity to receive any one of those as our thanks when you make a donation of any size. For now, though, let's bring on our special guest, Dr. Roy W. Spencer. Roy is a principal research scientist in the Earth System Science Center at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Uh, together with his colleague, Dr. John Christie, Roy received NASA's Exceptional Scientific Achievement Medal for their global temperature monitoring work in, uh, with satellites. Uh, Dr. Spencer's work with NASA continues as the U.S. science team leader for the advanced microwave scanning radiometer flying on NASA's Aqua satellite. He's provided congressional testimony several times on the subject of global warming, and his research has been entirely supported by government agencies, NASA, NOAA, the Department of Energy at the federal level, and the Office of the State Climatologist for the state of Alabama. For the record, in case anybody thinks he's on Big Oil's payroll, he has never been asked or paid by any oil company to perform any kind of service, not even ExxonMobil. 
Roy also serves on the board of directors of the Cornwall Alliance and is a senior fellow, having co-authored a number of our major papers running all the way back to 2006. Roy Spencer, welcome to From the Stacks. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Cal. Hey, Megan. It's good to be with you. Roy, before we dive into the meat of tonight's discussion, tell us just a little bit about yourself. How, you'd get, how did you get so interested in weather and climate that you've pursued a lifelong career in them? Well, I don't think anything that I've been involved in in terms of weather and climate would have ever happened if, and this sounds kind of weird, <laughs> if it hadn't been for my, uh, my mother dying when I was 13. She died of cancer. My dad was taking trips to Vietnam routinely, and I had a choice of either going to military school or going to live with my aunt and uncle in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and I chose the latter. And um, northern Michigan has interesting weather. And, I, you know, I, I didn't think then that I wanted to become a meteorologist, but after I got into college and thought that I wanted to be in computer science, one year of computer science at Michigan State University made me realize I didn't want to do that for a living. <laughs> um, so I had to search my soul and, and, and try to think of what exactly is it that I'm, I'm interested in? You know, what would I be most interested in? I wanted something that, that I would love rather than hate as a job because it, my dad seemed like he always hated his job. So it was a strong motivation for me for, to find something that, that I would like to do. Uh, and I thought really the weather was the only thing. And I thought, well, all you have to do is go to the local weather service office and, and go in and apply for a job, right? Well, no, <laughs> it's not that easy. Uh, so the, the meteorologist in charge there encouraged me to, to go get a degree. So I went to Michigan and I got my bachelor's degree. And he said, okay, well, if you really want to do better in life, you know, with your career, you get your master's. So I got accepted to the University of Wisconsin and I went and got my master's and I went back and I said, okay, so, you know, here we go with my career. And he says, now, if you really, really, really want to have complete control over your career, you need your PhD. <laughs> so I went back to Wisconsin <laughs> and got my PhD and, uh, and uh, Wisconsin, uh, as a meteorology school, uh, is known for satellites. Uh, the, Vern Sumi was sort of the inventor of the geostationary weather satellite. That's what you see the imagery, you know, every night during your, your weather report on the, on the TV. That's what you see is geostationary imagery. He was the one that sort of invented that technology. So we were very satellite focused. So I got to, you know, I, I specialized in satellite remote sensing. And then... Um, I finally got uh, asked to go to work for NASA at uh, Marshall Space Flight Center. Well, your principal work is as U.S. science team leader for the Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer flying on NASA's Aqua satellite. What is the Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer? How does it contribute to our understanding of global climate and particularly of trends in global temperature? Um, or have I even got that right? Well, uh, the AMSER instrument uh, was an instrument that measured all kinds of things in the climate system, uh, sea surface temperatures, precipitation, clouds, uh, wind speed, sea ice. The sea, it was the premier sea ice monitoring instrument for the, the, the North Polar area and then the area around Antarctica. Uh, and I was the principal research scientist on that uh, for many years until the instrument died. And then we continued improving the data sets from it. Uh, it, it. The instrument itself is sort of like a radar in reverse. It's a passive microwave radiometer. So it measures natural microwave emissions from the Earth uh, at different frequencies and different polarizations. I think this is stuff that the military does too. In fact, the very first good instrument we had in space was developed by the military. And we used that for a number of years before NASA developed their own instrument in collaboration with the Japanese. Well, friends, Dr. Spencer uh, has explained a lot about global temperatures in a short booklet, a guide to understanding global temperature data, which you can find on our online store, www.cornwallalliance.org and click on the shop button. Roy, uh, when did you first begin to get particularly interested in global warming or <laughs> climate change, as sometimes we call it? Now, 
I, I think you've told me that that was tied somehow to a meeting you and Dr. John Christie had with then Vice President Al Gore back in the 1990s. Uh, can you give us a little background? Well, it actually goes back before that, Cal. Um, in the late 1980s, everyone was talking about global warming. Uh, if you're old enough mm -hmm. to, to remember this, in 1988, global warming as uh, you, generally I recognized. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, we just figured out that Cal is 10 days older than me. So <laughs> neener, neener. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, in the late 1980s, everybody was talking about global warming because James Hansen had testified in Congress for then Senator Al Gore. Okay, so he was a senator back then. He was on the science committee. I think it was a science committee. And um, James Hansen thought that that warm summer we had in the U.S. in 1988 was uh, at least somewhat due to global warming. And that was front page news. I mean, that was New York Times. It was... Yeah. That's when global warming really became part of America's conscience. I mean, the, the, you know, we, we really started talking about it more. So, you know, those of us in NASA and everyone, everywhere, everybody was talking about it. So we were at a meeting, probably 1989, a NASA meeting in New Hampshire, I believe, and a number of us from here at Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, uh, we were there and we were discussing, you know, there's got to be a better way of, of, of measuring temperatures than using thermometers because, you know, thermometers are meant to measure temperatures for weather changes, you know, uh, tens of degrees uh, of change, not a fraction of a degree. So uh, somebody asked me, hey, don't we have a satellite up there or a series of satellites that we could use for that? And I said, yeah, it's just been used for weather monitoring, but I suppose if we got our hands on the data, we could do something with it and see whether we can monitor global temperatures with it. Now, that may seem like a, a, a small task today with the, with the power of computers we have today, but back then, uh, around 1989, it was difficult just to get the data from the government. I mean, it would have cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars if we had to pay for the full archive of data, because that's back when the government charged for to get any small amount of data. Um, but we this is where Al Gore comes in is, is later on. Uh, I testified uh, in Al Gore's uh, committee and uh, and he asked, is there, you know, is there anything that we can do to, to help you get all of the data? And I said, hell yeah. <laughs> so I dropped Al Gore's name with the people at the NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the people that were in charge of the data, because I was trying to get a cost estimate. And I said, well, you know, Al Gore really wants to get the answers from all of the data that you have in the archive. And he said, oh, well, we can just make that happen then. And then I started getting tapes. <laughs> I started getting tapes and tapes and you know, boxes and boxes of tapes in the mail, you know, big uh, uh, IBM tapes, you know, they're the, what, nine inches in diameter or whatever. And uh, I would load them in the back of my old used Honda Civic and, and drag them over to NASA's computer facility. And uh, in between computer runs where they were simulated, simulating the fluid flows in the uh, main engines of the space shuttle, uh, they would load up my tapes and load up all the data so I could analyze it. And that's where John Christie came in. John uh, uh, is good at analyzing large data sets. And so he and I worked together to put together a data set. Okay. Well, all right. as pretty much everybody in America knows, Gore became particularly famous for his film, An Inconvenient Truth, and his second film, An Inconvenient Sequel which presented the alarmist case about global warming in stunning form. The first film brought him an Oscar, and he also received, along with the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the Nobel Peace Prize. But Al Gore isn't a scientist, and you've had some pretty major complaints about those movies. Can you summarize a few of those complaints for us? Well, of course, I, I went to see a pre-screening. I was invited up to D.C. to, to, to watch a pre-screening of the... Uh, of the first movie, An Inconvenient Truth. Uh, and it just seemed like a lot of hype, um, you know, because he would show images of hurricanes and then say, and they're getting worse because of humans. You know, it was, it was, 
In fact, I once looked up propaganda on Wikipedia and there's like, you know, 15 different kinds of propaganda. And I went down the list and found that Al Gore used every single kind of propaganda technique in order to push the case that humans were to blame for all these disasters he was showing in the movie. So, you know, that annoyed me, uh, but I really didn't do anything about it until his second movie came out. He, it was uh, an inconvenient sequel. And that's just been, I think, three years ago. And uh, the book for it, it had a book with it, just like the, the first movie did. Uh, and I saw it in Kroger and I thought, you know, I need to get that and, uh, and, and see what's in it this time to see whether it's just, as, it still is crazy. And I went through it and, and it was indeed just as crazy. The claims in it were just as exaggerated and some of, it, some of them were just plain false. Uh, and I thought, man, I got to write a little book response to this because it was just coming out in the theaters. And then within a few days, uh, it, the, the movie showed up here in Huntsville. I was going to drive up to Nashville to see the movie, but it turned out that if I would wait three days, I could watch the movie in Huntsville. So I went to the movie in Huntsville when it showed up. And we have some nice theaters here. Uh, it was showing in one theater. Okay. Uh, I showed up for one of the first showings. There were three of us in the audience. We didn't know each other. Okay. I just noticed there were two other people in the audience. And uh, in about, within about 15 minutes, the first one of the people left. And I think one more stuck it out. I don't recall whether I was the last one left, but I was madly taking notes, you know, through the whole thing. Every claim that he was making, I was marking down. And then I immediately got to working on the book because every claim on in his book was was at, at least a half truth and at worst uh, an absolute falsehood. I mean, just to give some examples, you know, he, he starts out, um, walking around Miami Beach with uh, the mayor, I think, the mayor of Miami Beach. And, you know, the water in the street is is covering their shoes and they're talking about, you know, how sea levels are rising, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Well, of course, any place that's built very low, you know, close to sea level is going to have problems. And Miami Beach has problems during so-called king tides. So they did that movie when the tides were exceptionally high, but at least as important as that is that we now have synthetic aperture radar measurements from space showing that that area, Miami Beach, is sinking just as fast as sea level is rising. And the reason why the land is sinking is because Miami Beach was built on reclaimed swampland. Okay, so none of this stuff comes out in the movie. So th that's an example of exaggeration. And then there were some just outright falsehoods like him claiming that that uh, China was on on totally on the solar bandwagon, which is crazy. At the time he claimed this, China was building, finishing building one coal fired electric power plant every week in order to meet electricity demand. <laughs> I mean, you can still grow your solar, but if it's only growing at 1% rate what you need, and you're making up the other 99% with coal power. How, you, how can you say that China is a, is a leader? And then things like he, he was claiming that, the, that crop productivity is down around the world or in certain countries, I forget specifically. It's in, that, in, in my retort book, the, that, mm -hmm. uh, An Inconvenient Deception. But it was just plain false because that's something else I've, I've followed for the last 10 years. I've been a consultant uh, for agricultural interests in the U.S. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, crops of every kind, uh, the, the long-term trend has been upward uh, in terms of productivity and uh, yields. That is, you know, the number of bushels per acre or whatever that crop is measured in. Wow. Well, friends, if you know people who've seen an inconvenient sequel and found it persuasive, we want you to know that Roy wrote this great refutation, which you can also get on our website. An Inconvenient Deception, How Al Gore Distorts Climate Science and Energy Policy um, is on www.cornwallalliance.org forward slash shop forward slash. Okay, Roy. Uh, so let's let's try to get down now to some basics about climate change or 
to be more specific, uh, since climate change involves a whole lot more than just change in temperature, about global warming. In a number of your books um, and on your outstanding blog at drroyspencer.com, that's www.drroyspencer.com, you've provided a really helpful illustration about what makes temperatures rise or fall in any given spot or, or on the planet as a whole. Take our audience through that, will you? Yeah, the place I like to start in explaining climate change and global warming with people is I, I try to put it in terms that they can understand. And the place I start is explaining that the temperature change in anything is always due to an imbalance between energy gained going into the system and energy being lost by the system. <clears throat> Excuse me, got to take a drink. And this is true. This is true whether we talk about the human body, a car engine, uh, a pot of water on the stove, uh, or the climate system, everything. In order for the temperature of something to change, it's always related to how fast energy is entering the system versus how fast it's leaving the system. So for instance, a pot of water on the stove, you, you, to heat it up, you know, let's say you've got a, a gas flame and you turn it on low and the water of course then warms up right but it doesn't keep warming up if you've got the pot on low the the water will reach a certain temperature and then stop warming up that the temperature will stop increasing even though you're pumping energy from the flame into it well why is that it's because at some point the pot gets hot enough to where it loses energy so fast to its surroundings that the rate of energy loss to its surroundings equals the rate of energy gain from the gas flame underneath, okay? So that's a simple example. And you experience it every day, all the time, you know, everything around you, everything is, in a, is, is constantly changing temperature, if only by tiny amounts, and it's because of energy changes. So the same thing is true of the climate system. And the energy source for the climate system is the sun, obviously, uh, but what is less easy to understand is the mechanism of energy loss for the climate system. There's only one, and that is the loss of infrared radiation to outer space. So the whole Earth is constantly radiating to outer space infrared radiation. Okay, that's the heat you feel, you know, radiant heat from the stove or from a fireplace. Um, our skin isn't that sensitive to it, so it typically takes you know, many degrees of warming before we feel that radiant heat on our skin. It's not, we're not that sensitive to it. So that's what's involved in global warming theory is CO2 being added to the atmosphere changes the energy balance of the climate system. It doesn't change the incoming, the sunlight, <clears throat> excuse me. It changes the rate at which infrared radiation escapes from the earth to outer space. OK, uh, it reduces that rate by a tiny, tiny, tiny bit. Uh, in fact, the rate that it reduces or the amount that it reduces the rate of energy lost outer space, that energy, that change in energy flow is smaller than our knowledge of any of the energy flows in the climate system. OK, in other words, Climate change could be mostly natural and we would never know it, okay? It's a matter of faith on the part of climate scientists. They believe that the earth is in a constant state of energy balance, you know, that the, that hmm. the temperature remains constant over time, all right? Constant over time, unless humans get involved, okay? Well, you can see that huh. that's, almost a philosophical position to take to think that the earth always stays the same unless humans get involved but that believe well, me and that it's also, is Roy, isn't it also just clearly contrary to geologic history i mean we have we have paleo 
evidence of significant changes in global temperature from long well, before human civilization came around, long before we started burning a lot of fossil fuels. Well, that, that's true. Uh, and a lot of geologists remind me of that, geologists that are on our side of the issue or more on the skeptical side. Uh, but I, I guess that doesn't sway me very much because those changes were over, you know, what, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, pick a number. It's totally outside the realm of human experience. Uh, what we're talking about is changes over several decades. Um, and we really don't know in the past on the scale of several decades, whether there was warming and cooling going on. Uh, there is some proxy evidence that over the last one to 2000 years, that there are periods when the temperature goes up and down by quite a lot, which obviously a thousand years ago was natural. But now when it happens, it's blamed on humans, right? Well, how do you know? Okay. You don't know. It's a matter of faith. I mean, I understand the science and I understand why the science advance it, but I, I just try to point out that they are making assumptions that the climate system is, is you know, in a state of stability, that it, extreme stability um, for, for the last 100 or 200 or 300 years and that it was going to stay that way until we got involved. And it's just, you know, my faith isn't that strong to believe in that theory. So, so Earth's atmosphere will warm toward the surface when the amount of energy moving from the surface out into space is less than the amount moving toward the surface. And it'll cool when the energy moving out to space is more than the amount moving toward the surface. Where does carbon dioxide come into play in all of this? Does it, does it act like a lid on a pan of water on the stove? Well, in, energetically, yes, it does. Uh, that's the simplest explanation I sometimes use. Um, let's say, let's go back to that pan of water on the stove that you've got a low gas flame under it and it's, it's warmed up to, let's say, 150 degrees. Well, any cook, anybody that boils water knows that they can make that water hotter without turning up the flame if the pot is open, right? You just put a lid on the pot and the water gets hotter. Well, it got hotter without increasing the energy input. It got hotter because you decreased the energy lost by the pot. You've reduced the pot's okay. ability to cool itself to its surroundings. So it heats up until it gets hot enough to where it once again reaches a state of energy balance where the energy lost by the now hotter pot equals the gain from the, the flame underneath the pot. So does this mean, Roy, that you are not a denier? Uh, no, no, I'm not a denier of climate change. I'm not even a denier of human caused climate change. The science behind uh, the warming effect of carbon dioxide is is very strong. Um, but it may, it's mainly from the laboratory, but I don't see how you could get around some amount of warming when you add CO2 to the atmosphere. The question is how much? I'm a, a denier that there's going to be catastrophic global warming. We're not seeing any sign of that yet. In fact, and we'll be talking about that this hour, uh, how the warming so far has been, you know, maybe a half of what was expected by scientists. And that we think that I and some, a minority of other scientists working out on the issue think that that is because there are processes in the atmosphere that are called feedbacks that respond to the warming in such a way to reduce the warming. Climate science, on the other hand, uh, mainstream climate science believes that when warming occurs, that those feedbacks are positive and there's an amplification of the warming. Megan? Well, all, all of this sounds fairly simple, pretty basic physics. Why then is there so much controversy among scientists about how much warming comes from carbon dioxide that we add to the atmosphere? Well, there isn't controversy about how much warming there would be 
let's say if you doubled the amount of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. We aren't yet to, to CO2 doubling yet. Uh, they think it was about 270 parts per million before uh, the Industrial Revolution. And we're not up to double that, which would be 540 yet. We're at about 400 or 410. Uh, but if it were to double and the climate system would warm up and nothing else changed, if nothing else changed but the temperature, if the clouds remain the same and the water vapor remain the same and everything else remain the same, the warming from doubling of CO2 would only be about one degree, 1.3 degrees C, something like that. It wouldn't even be an issue uh, in terms of energy policy. So it's these feedbacks that either reduce the warming from the direct warming from CO2 or amplify it. That's where all of the uncertainty is. And the climate scientists are still in disagreement about how much warming there's going to be, but it's a disagreement in is the amplification going to be modest or is it going to be catastrophic? <laughs> you know, they, they aren't talking about the possibility that the earth could actually change in such a way to reduce the warming from just the CO2. They think the feedbacks, these, these temperature dependent changes in clouds and water vapor and other things are going to amplify the warming. And uh, I know we're going to talk about that a little bit here, but it's, <clears throat> it's fascinating that the original estimate of warming from doubling of CO2 back in 1979, as originally published, was anywhere from 1.5 degrees C to 4.5 degrees C. Okay, you know, 1.5 1, 1. is tolerable. 4.5 would probably cause some problems for humanity. Uh, so that's a factor of three, right? It's been 1.5 to 4.5, despite billions and billions of dollars of investment in 20 some different climate models around the world, you know, with a marching army of literally probably tens of thousands of scientists, it's still a factor of three uncertainty, uh, even in the latest estimates. Hmm. So since pre-industrial times, human activity, presumably together with some natural phenomena, have raised carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere by nearly 50%. And at the current rate of increase, uh, it seems likely to reach double the pre-industrial level late in this century. Is there a fairly straightforward way to calculate how much the atmosphere near Earth's surface should warm in response to, say, a doubling of the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere? Before we start trying to take into account how various other elements of our climate system respond to it. In other words, before we start thinking about the, the feedbacks. In other words, you, you said, Roy, that, that it's pretty well agreed that the doubling of CO2 by itself, assuming everything else remains unchanged, would raise global average surface temperature by right around about one degree Celsius, which is about 1.8 degree Fahrenheit. Uh, how do we calculate that? What, what is it that tells us that? Well, that's an interesting question. It's something that you cannot create an experiment to uh, test a real world experiment. It comes from the measured infrared properties of uh, the effect of infrared radiation as it goes through carbon dioxide in different air samples in a laboratory. They use spectrometers to measure how much infrared radiation is intercepted by carbon dioxide in different air samples. And they have to measure this uh, at different air pressures because as you go up through the atmosphere, the pressure goes down mm -hmm. at different temperatures. Uh, I think there's a third variable, I forget what it is right now, but there's you know a variety of atmospheric variables they have to measure. They've made thousands of measurements of, of what, what, how infrared radiation is absorbed as you increase the CO2. And from there, you have to take those actual measurements and then you have to make a radiative transfer code in a computer. Uh, hmm. and, and then it's actually a couple of levels. You have to do a radiative code to express the theory of infrared radiation across all infrared, the whole infrared spectrum that affects the cooling rate of the earth. And then you have to do a radio transfer model, which estimates 
as you go through up through the atmosphere through hundreds or thousands of layers, uh, how the, the radiation is affected in terms of, you know, how much does a layer in the, any layer in the atmosphere absorb infrared? How does it emit it? And it's emitting and absorb, it's emitting up and down and it's absorbing mm -hmm. from and sideways from infrared coming from the top, from the bottom. It's, it's a tough, you know, we're used to thinking in terms of, of sunlight, right? You know, sunlight mostly uh -huh. comes to the surface and warms the surface. Well, in the infrared, everything is a source, you know, for sunlight, the sun is the only source in infrared. Mm -hmm. Everything is the source, everything around you, you know, in, in the room you're in, uh, the sky above you, clouds, trees, everything emits infrared radiation and absorbs infrared radiation, which makes it a more difficult computational problem. Um, and it makes it harder to intuit, you know, your intuition of figuring out what's going on, uh, which makes a lot of people uh, disbelieve that it actually exists, but it, it does. There's, there's simple things you can to prove it to yourself. Um, and to get to your question of how do we know, well, it's, it's those laboratory measurements, but then pump through a whole bunch of, of computer code. But I trust it. I mean, I, I think it's, 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 it's solid science, that part of it. I think the uncertainty is so in the that, feedbacks. So the direct warming <coughs> effect then is pretty much uncontroversial. Uh, whereas it's the indirect con uh, warming effect after the input of all the different feedbacks where the real controversy uh, comes on. Is that, is that right? That's right. Okay. So um, for all of our viewers, uh, we're about to start to get into some of the more controversial things, at least uh, among climate scientists. So that you can learn more about this later, we're also offering uh, through our online store, another of Roy's books, this time his book, Global Warming Skepticism for Busy People. Uh, just like uh, for the other books, uh, this is from our online store at uh, cornwallalliance.org forward slash shop. And uh, you can see that and his other books there and a bunch of other things as well. So I'd invite you to, to go there to that store. Okay, so Roy, the controversy comes when you start trying to figure out how other parts of the climate system respond to that initial direct warming from added CO2. What are some of the other parts of the climate system and do they increase CO2's direct warming or do they decrease it or, or what? And uh, what would you say are the most important feedbacks and how much do we know about how they act? Well, the two most important ones I would say are probably cloud feedbacks and water vapor feedbacks. So that both of those are basically the influence of moisture in the atmosphere. Uh, clouds have a profound impact on infrared radiation, uh, especially the high altitude ones, the cirrus clouds, they have the biggest warming effect because they, uh, they don't, they, they intercept a lot more infrared radiation than they uh, block out solar radiation. Low clouds hmm. uh, are more of an effect on solar radiation. So anything that affects any temperature dependent change in clouds that affects either sunlight coming in and being absorbed or infrared radiation escaping to outer space, any, of, any changes there are, are important, okay? And everyone agrees, and this is, includes people that believe that, that climate change is, is potentially very serious, uh, that clouds are probably the number one uncertainty. They're still, still trying to figure out clouds. We really don't understand them as well as we should. I mean, we, we understand their average effects, the average effect of clouds. There was but we a don't song understand. about that once upon a time, wasn't there? <clears throat> yes, there was. Uh, yes, we really don't. <laughs> I really don't know clouds at all, right? <laughs> Uh, and then the other one Even is water you're one vapor. Of the world's leading scientists on clouds, right? <laughs> well, I wouldn't call myself a world leader on clouds. There, are, there are scientists that have spent their whole careers just studying clouds, and uh, and they're still difficult uh, for those people. Uh, water vapor is the other thing. Water vapor is 
the the uh, the climate system's main greenhouse gas. It's been estimated that if if we didn't have water vapor in the atmosphere, it would be a very different climate system. It could be it would be too cold to to grow crops. Um, large parts of the of the polar areas would be you know for, you know frozen continuously. Uh, so greenhouse the greenhouse effect is important. I mean it, it makes the earth habitable. Uh, so the the green the natural greenhouse effect is a good thing, and most of that greenhouse effect is due to water vapor. CO two is is relatively minor, but but not inconsequential. Um, now the the thing about water vapor is that everyone assumes that that uh, that the water vapor feedback, which basically doubles the CO two effect, uh, they think that that's a solved problem, and I don't think it is. Yes, the atmosphere fills up with more water vapor uh, the warmer it gets. Uh, there's more evaporation from the surface, and the atmosphere tends to get more moist. Now, that's true for the lowest layers of the atmosphere. The upper layer of the atmosphere, the upper layers, the, the water vapor content of the upper part of the atmosphere is due to precipitation processes, okay? It's not due to surface evaporation, it's due to what happens in precipitation systems. So for instance, if with warming, precipitation systems became more efficient at producing precipitation, that could actually be a negative feedback on warming. And that's one of the things that we've been analyzing some satellite data trying to figure out. And we are seeing evidence somewhat in that direction. I say somewhat in that the, the measurements that we've got from satellites and from radiation budget instruments on, on uh, spacecraft that are orbiting the Earth suggests that water vapor feedback is positive, but not as positive as the climate models suggest uh, that it, they, they think it is. Uh, and it's because the climate mm -hmm. models that they use just have very simple precipitation microphysics in them relating, which you have to know in order to uh, get how much water vapor there's going to be in the atmosphere, you know, our main greenhouse gas. How is precipitation process is going to change? Uh, we don't know because we don't even understand it. I mean, it's not a case of knowing, but the computers aren't fast enough to put it in the computers. That's not the case. We don't understand it. But, you know, take your own experience. Uh, for those of you that have been, you know, in the tropics, uh, you've seen some pretty modest clouds produce huge amounts of rain. I think warmer uh, precipitation systems tend to be more efficient. I've seen the heavy, some of the heaviest rain I've seen have come out of very shallow clouds in the tropics. Hmm. <coughs> so, so this then is, is where the computer models come in, right? I mean, scientists use them to try to account for all those other factors in nature. I, I understand that some of the earliest models like that used by the Charney report under President Carter over 40 years ago, and I think that's what you were referring to earlier, concluded that for every doubling of carbon dioxide, we'd see an increase in global average surface temperature of about 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius, or for most of our listeners, that's 2.7 to 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit. In the late 90s, the Intergovern Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change used more sophisticated computer climate models and narrowed the range a little bit to 2.0 to 4.5 degrees Celsius or 3.6 to 8.1 degrees Fahrenheit. That would seem to indicate some progress, but then something strange happened with the IPCC's fifth assessment report released in 2013. You using newer, even more sophisticated models called CMIP-5 for Coupled, a coupled model intercomparison project, fifth generation. It gave a different range. Well, what was that and how did that happen? Well, as I recall, didn't, oh, yeah, I think it, it wasn't, it went back to 1.5 to 4.5 again, didn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Um, how did that happen? And then the most, huh? How did that happen? Oh, well. Who knows? I mean, the cynic in me, uh, I mean, I hate to say it, but the cynic in me uh, realizes, because I used to work for government and I used to lobby, help to lobby Congress to get money for NASA's mission to planet Earth. If there isn't a problem to study, you don't get money for it, okay? The bigger the problem, 
you can make it sound like the more money you get. Okay, that's the way the game is played. Well, I got a feeling that these climate modelers don't want the climate modeling enterprise to ever end. In other words, they don't ever want to find the answer. So the cynic in me half suspects that they don't want to, to reduce this range of warming estimates more than it currently is, a factor of three uncertainty, uh, you know, because that keeps the money coming in. Um, I hate to say that, but, you know, I, I know what it, how hard it can be to get money uh, to do this kind of research. So, in other words, those, those fifth generation models, after governments and businesses around the world had spent billions of dollars trying to improve them, actually broadened the range of what's called climate sensitivity, the warming to be expected from doubled CO2 after, after all the climate feedbacks have been accounted for. That would seem to indicate that rather than gaining better understanding of the climate system, our understanding was actually getting worse. How can that be? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I mean, guess. It, I, it, cynicism well, aside. <laughs> yeah, well, that's entirely possible. I mean, it could be we're nowhere near the level of knowledge that we need to be in order to predict climate change. That's entirely possible. It could be it's not a, a solvable problem. Uh, the, the, the climate system is immensely complex. Uh, I, I sometimes say it's not rocket science. It's way harder than that. Uh, you know, <laughs> sending, sending satellites into orbit and, and landing a rover on Mars and putting men on the moon, yes, those are, those are great accomplishments, but basically the only thing that they really have to deal with is the force of gravity, which is well quantified. Uh, it's, you know, it's the reason why we can predict when the, the full moon is going to be 100 years in advance and, and where, the, the, where the moon is going to be in the sky uh, 100 years from right now. Um, it's because it's, it's, it's easy. It's just gravity and mass, you know, and you know how much mass there is, where it's distributed, distances between the masses, you know, between the moon and Mars and all of the heavenly bodies and, and the sun. And once you know that it's, you still need a computer, but it, it's the, the physics is well known. There's very little in the climate system where the physics is well known. Uh, I, I should I should add a caveat that these climate models are basically modified versions of weather forecast models. And weather forecast models, I mean, I'm originally a meteorologist, so I, I know a lot about weather and weather forecasting. Um, I keep up with it. And uh, the models have really gotten a lot better in the last 30 years. Uh, and they keep getting better. It, it, sometimes it's almost magical uh, what weather forecast models can predict that a seasoned weather forecaster looking at today's weather map would never suspect is going to happen, okay? But, you yeah. know, that's only out four, five, six days, you know, uh, of, of a forecast uh, horizon. And, and here we're dealing with a climate system where we're trying to, to forecast things out 50 a hundred, two hundred years. Yeah, a little difference. <laughs> Back in June, Roy, uh, you blogged that the sixth generation climate models, CMIP-6, were actually worse than the CMIP-5 models and were simulating 50% more warming than was actually observed since 1979. Why is that important? To debates over whether carbon dioxide induced warming is going to be catastrophic, mildly harmful, neutral, mildly helpful, or, or even perhaps greatly helpful? Well, this is something that we had been hearing for the last couple of years is it looked like the latest crop of climate models for the CMIP-6 uh, intercomparison project were actually producing more warming than the previous generation, the CMIP-5 version of those models. And we found that kind of hard to believe, but it turned out to be the case that indeed, generally speaking, they are producing eh, not a lot more, but significantly more. Rather than this 1.5 to four and a half degrees, it's now looking more like two degrees to close to six degrees range of warming. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure about the details, but it's it's a little more. It's it's <coughs> it's enough to worry about. And to get to your 
your question, how is that significant? Well, obviously, if the climate modeling community says global warming is going to be worse than we thought, then the policymakers, when it comes to energy policy, are going to have more pressure on them uh, to do something, you know, to, to do something about, uh, well, you know, increase the use of wind and solar. It's going to be hard to do. That's a, that's a subject for another time because uh, fossil fuels, uh, the, the amount of energy you need to run humanity, you know, the demand by, by humanity for energy is just so great. It, there's no way to meet the majority of it with, with uh, current technology applied to um, wind power and solar power. Uh, so unless, you know, people start embracing nuclear power much quicker and we do a, a, a bus gut effort to increase the number of nuclear power plants, I don't see that changing. So that's how it impacts the, um, the debate is, you know, the warmer the models, the more push there is to do something about uh, about global warming. So part of what we need is to be able to test these models. I mean, and so we test them how? We, we can't test them by comparing them with the future because the future isn't around yet. Uh, so lots of people will try to defend the computer models by saying, well, they can reproduce past global temperature trends pretty accurately, uh, but you're not so sure of that. Why not? Well, first of all, they know what the answer is, okay? They, they know what the global temperature data sets look like, and they've known it for 30 years, uh, so they can tweak their, muscle, their models. They can make little adjustments to, uh, to, to make the models agree better with the observations, all right? So for instance, there was a lack of warming from about the 1940s until the late 1970s. It was basically flat, mm -hmm. no warming. Uh, in order to explain that, the only thing they could think of is, well, you know, we were burning so much dirty coal, we had all this sulfur pollution in the atmosphere that was reflecting sunlight uh, and cooling things down and countering up Counter, counteracting the effect of warming from the CO2. Now think about this, okay? That in order to explain no change in the climate system, they had to invoke humans, okay? This isn't to, a, to explain change, this is to explain no change. They invoke humans <laughs> causing a cooling effect, which is just exactly counteracting a warming effect, you know? It's it's kind of ridiculous. Um, not that it, it not that it that means it's wrong. It's just kind of funny the way the way we look at, at all of this in terms of humans are the cause of everything. You know that nature couldn't be involved. So anyway, so they know that the answer uh, to begin with. So you would think they could make the models to pretty accurately reproduce what's happened in the past. And it turns out it's pretty darn hard. They can't. They they still really can't. Uh, uh, reproduce very well the warming from uh, say 1900 until 1940. There was quite a bit of warming. It was ne nearly as much, nearly as big a warming rate during that period as in the last 40 years. Okay. How did that happen? Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, I have, we've done some research on it and I have my, my own theory, but the, the point is they had the answer. It seems like they could, they could fit the model to the data and yet when we compare the models hindcasts, not forecasts, but what the models say should have happened in the past, the models still produce too much warming. Uh, it depends on who's doing the calculations, but as much as you know, 10 to, to 50% too much warming, let's say over the, since, oh, the last 40 years, let's say, or the last 50 years. Yeah. Uh, so then, there's a simpler way to attack the problem rather than using these fancy models um, you can just do these energy budget calculations. And this is something that was done by Judith Curry and uh, a mathematician, I believe, in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they computed based on, even if you assume that the climate system was in a state of balance back in the late 1800s, okay? Just assume that. Mm -hmm. We don't know it, but let's assume it. They looked at how much the climate system has warmed, our best estimate of surface warming, our best estimate of the deep oceans warming. Okay, this is all 
due to a radiative imbalance. They use the same cause of the warming, the, the radiative forcing, we call it, from CO2 and some other things, uh, increasing methane and other things. Uh, even those aerosols, they put that in there too. And they calculate directly what the climate sensitivity is. You know, is it one point, that 1.5? Is it 4.5? They calculate it directly just based on energy budget principles rather than taking this, you know, billion dollar climate model and expecting it to, to go through all of the physics and all of the stuff that we really don't understand very well and have it pop out the right answer. So they came up with, you know, they, they used a very simple method for doing this. And they came up with an equal or equilibrium climate sensitivity of about 1.5 degrees C. That's at the low end of that 1.5 yeah. to 4.5 range. And I was surprised to see that published uh, because, um, I mean, Judith Curry is, is, is a well-respected name in, in the meteorological research community. Uh, but they got that published in a mainline climate journal, the Journal of Climate. And uh, I was surprised to see that. I'm surprised because there are gate we've learned over the years uh, in our own experience and also from the, from the climate gate emails that the people that disagree with us do everything they can to keep our research papers out of the published, uh, you know, out of the peer reviewed and published uh, scientific literature. So part of what you're saying is that uh, the reason they can come even reasonably close in looking at past temperature trends is that they already know the answer. So it's a matter of curve fitting. They can just uh, adjust certain parameters till they get it right and then say, okay, then this is what, <laughs> this is what actually happened. All right. Which yes. Is, is and somebody, kind of cheating. and one of, <laughs> and one of their scientists actually pointed this out. He published a paper and said, Hey, all you modelers, you, you all end up with around the same result for what's happened, uh, say, from 1900 to 2000. Uh, and yet you, you have very different uh, amounts of forcing. And what he discovered was that the climate modelers were using the very uncertain aerosol effect, this, uh, this sulfate aerosol, mm -hmm. you know, from the dirty coal burning from the 1940s to the 1970s. They were using that as a tuning parameter to get their model to agree better with the observations. So that's, this isn't just me claiming this, you know, it's one of their own people, you know, pointed it out in one of his publications. He, he backed that, he could see that's yeah. what they were doing. Yeah, yeah, they, they fudge, yeah. but they make it sound like it's basic physics. It's basic physics. Their models are basic physics. Well, yeah, the, you know, yeah. That, the, that, C, that increasing CO2 should cause some warming is basic physics, but it's a huge jump to then claim that the output of the, the warming output of their model is a result of basic physics. No, it's not. Yeah, I, I, I love to respond to the basic physics uh, claim by saying, yeah, um, the basic idea that there's going to be warming, that's basic physics, but it's also basic physics that if you drop, you know, you drop a rock and a feather at the same moment from the same height, they're going to hit the ground at the same moment unless they're in the air. In which case, you know, the rock plummets and the feather kind of wafts down little by little. And if it's windy, it can blow up into a tree and get stuck and not come down till the tree falls. You know, so the world is a whole lot more complicated place than just basic physics. So, well, we're, we're just about out of time. If you could leave our viewers with just any one, two, maybe three closing observations about the about the global warming climate change debate, what would they be, Roy? Well, I think people need to realize that there's <clears throat> a lot of half-truths involved in, in climate change research. Yes, increasing CO2 should cause some warming. The amount of warming is, is very uncertain as evidenced by the fact that their climate models still produce a factor of three range in terms of how much warming there will be in response to increasing CO2. So despite, you know, tens of billions of dollars of research and, and dozens of, of, of research uh, modeling research groups around the world, they, it seems it almost feels like they're not making progress. Uh, the other thing mm -hmm. is that the observations don't support the models. Generally speaking, the warming rate of the Earth's surface and of the deep ocean 
tends to be consistent with a low climate sensitivity of around 1.5 degrees. This is something that we're finding also. Uh, and then there's the whole, you know, scientists can't decide what we should do about this problem, right? Uh, they, they just provide input. So the other thing we need to realize is, you know, even if we knew for a fact that it was going to be 2.5 degrees of warming uh, as a result of doubling CO2, say 150 years in the future, uh, that doesn't prove that you need to do anything about it. Uh, uh, Bjorn Lomborg, uh, the economist, uh, has, has argued strongly. He, he believes the science, but he thinks it's stupid to try to fix it until we have uh, alternative energy strategies uh, which can compete with fossil fuels because it, it will do more harm to humanity than just living with somewhat warmer temperatures. And we know that, that you know, cold weather still kills at least 10 times as many people as hot weather. Um, that's, mm. that's well documented. Plus, all of we, the one thing we haven't discussed is increasing CO2. Uh, this, is, this is a big deal that uh, it's been calculated that it has increased agricultural productivity by trillions of dollars. I mean, it's, it's plant food and, uh, and plants just grow yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Roy, thanks. Thanks again very, very much for joining us. I, I, hope, I hope we can do it again. Well, thanks for having me, Cal. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, next week, we will not be doing a new episode of From the Stacks because of Thanksgiving week. But come back to us after that. Meanwhile, if you've missed some of our past programs, you can find them here on our Facebook page or at our YouTube channel, Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Please do tell your friends about us and invite them to watch shows with you. And remember, as, as our thanks, uh, when you make a 100% tax deductible donation of any size, literally any size, no matter how small, of course, we'd appreciate it if you'd be generous, but nonetheless, as our thanks, when you make a tax deductible, 100% tax deductible donation of any size, we'll gladly send you one of the four, uh, one of, well, pardon me, we will gladly send you the uh, DVD documentary, Fractured, Language, Lies, and Energy. And uh, all you need to do is go to cornwallalliance.org, uh, click on the donut, uh, donate button, not the donut button. Uh, we don't sell donuts and we don't give donuts, but uh, click on donate. And after you fill out the form in the content, comments field, enter fractured and the word promo code 2011. That's promo code 2011. Also remember that Roy's booklet, A Guide to Understanding Global Temperature Data, and his two books, An Inconvenient Deception and Global Warming Skepticism, are all available through our online store at cornwallalliance.org slash shop. Uh, just go there and you can order those as well as quite a number of other good resources. Um, <clears throat> thanks again for joining us tonight. And uh, we hope that you will join us in weeks to come. Again, tell your friends about us for From the Stacks. <laughs>